Welcome back to Not Your Forte, a music education podcast geared towards college students to help you survive and thrive throughout your undergrad. I'm Eric Tinkler, a fourth year music education student here at Kansas State University, and usually I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Philip Payne, the music ed advisor here at K-State, but today I'll be joined by Dr. Matthew O'Rao, the chair of the music ed department and associate director of bands at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. Dr. Aral and I will be talking about the power of positivity in this different world, as well as his new movement, Upbeat Global. A couple of announcements before we head on into the bulk of the interview. One, you'll have heard it right at the beginning. We have new intro music. Thank you very much to Sam Allison, who is a composition major here at Kansas State University, for composing this short intro for us and allowing us to use it. I very much appreciate it. Uh, couple more announcements just as, as i said last week we are now on to a weekly schedule of the podcast every single friday will be coming to you so dr Payne and i are super excited about that and we're excited to continue to share great content and, and help help out all you guys through these different weird times uh, make sure that you take a second pause the podcast Rate five stars, subscribe if you're not subscribed on whatever app you're listening to. Like We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube even. We'll be doing some more kind of video stuff uh, as we go through this time of, of social distancing. <laughs> and, and just share it, like it, do all that thing. That really helps us um, continue to grow, continue to um, uh, spread our listener base and help out more and more people e each and every week. Um, while you're at that, Follow us on our social media, that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We'll continue to push out some great content on those as well. And just one final ask of uh, the listeners, of you guys, whatever age, whatever stage of life you may be, from freshmen to seniors to current teachers, send us, send us either through our social media uh, message boards or through our email, notyourfortepodcast at gmail.com what you're doing to adjust to uh, this time of, of social distancing and quarantine and COVID-19. We, we want to talk about that a little bit in our next episode. And, and we, we want to see what you guys, our listeners, are, are doing to adjust. Um, talk about um, positive experiences, some, some things you've had to overcome. Talk about learning experiences, um, how classes are going, how teaching classes are going. And just overall, what you are doing to make your education as successful as it can be, or your students' education be as successful as it can be. Well, let's go ahead. I've been talking long enough. Let's get right into the interview. Dr. Rao, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Oh, it's so great to be here, Eric. Thanks for the, the invitation. I'm oh, doing not, great. <laughs> not a problem. Thank you so much for, for uh, taking time from, from what I'm sure is your busy day to uh, join me over this, uh, this Zoom session right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a real joy. It's, it's not a problem at all. Happy to be here. So let, let's go ahead. Let's dive in. Let's, let's talk a little bit about you for, first and foremost for anyone who hasn't heard about you. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Right. Well, uh, I am currently a professor at Lawrence University Conservatory of Music in Appleton, Wisconsin. I am the chair of music education and the associate director of bands. And I love uh, that position because it, it uh, combines two of my true loves, which is uh, music education and uh, band directing. So I get to be the symphonic band conductor and uh, get to walk the talk and uh, continue to be creative and develop my skills as a music educator while simultaneously preparing future music educators. That's awesome. Let, let, let's, let's step it back a little bit. How about like talk a little bit about where you grew up? Why did you get into music, into band? Yeah, so I, I grew up, uh, started in Los Angeles, and then we moved to Sacramento when I was four. So I'm from California. And I just seemed to have always loved music. My parents were really uh, supportive of my creativity, which generally uh, amounted to me uh, standing on, on a, a bed with a tennis racket and belting out songs that I was making up <laughs> uh, starting when I was about five years old and then formed a, a rock band with my little brother called the Annual Flames and <laughs> started piano when I was seven and fell in love with a saxophone in second grade when I uh, heard a sixth grade a traditional jazz band perform and decided I want to play saxophone. So I started that when I was nine 
and uh, saxophone then became my true love and, and continued to perform all the way through high school. I had some adventures, uh, had the opportunity to perform at Dizzy Gillespie at the Monterey Jazz Festival and toured Japan two summers at the Monterey Jazz Festival High School All-Star Jazz Band. And that's maybe was the beginning of when I really understood the universal language of music, you know, spending time in Japan and then doing exchange concerts with Japanese students was so powerful as a, as a high school student. And then I decided to go to Lawrence University for undergraduate work where I studied uh, jazz performance, classical performance, uh, music education, and a uh, government major. Uh, quad, quadruple <laughs> major? <laughs> you, know, you got that right. Yeah, I was a quadruple major and a dual certification in political science and music. <laughs> so, and, yeah. So how did a California boy end up in Wisconsin? <laughs> right, that's a great question. And I was fortunate that my uncle, my uncle George actually went to Lawrence and he told me all about it. And uh, the more I researched and when I went out to visit Lawrence, I just fell in love with the campus and the professors and it just felt right. And, and for all the college students listening, you know what I mean, right? When you go to that college visit, you either feel welcomed and a part of the family or maybe you don't. Uh, and that can really determine where you end up. But I, I had a great time meeting my saxophone professor, the government professor, and the jazz professor, and, and I just felt like wanted, which is important, Yeah, and I uh, felt like this is a place I could really spread my wings. So that's, so, that's where it's So tell me a little bit into, like, what went into the decision to, I mean, all that, those music majors, and then government too, what, what went into that decision? What were you wanting to do when you, when you got to college? Well, it's fascinating, and I actually didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to do, which, which, which maybe isn't too all uncommon, but I uh, really was into academics in high school as well. And so I, had, I literally thought about becoming a lawyer, a uh, defense attorney at one point. I also thought about being a political science professor. And actually becoming a political science professor was on my mind for many years at Lawrence, considered going to graduate school in public policy. And uh, towards the end, though, of my time, it just really started to solidify. And then student teaching just really uh, made it clear to me that uh, teaching music was where my heart and soul lay and I just couldn't wait to begin teaching. So it, it was a process though. I was really into performance. I think I also considered being a professional jazz musician along the way. And, uh, but uh, there were two things that I realized that I truly loved and, and one was performing and the other one was teaching. And, and I just felt like I could bring those together uh, in being coming a uh, music teacher. Cool. Let, let, let's 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 keep touching on your uh, your college experience here. Sure. Uh, let, let, let's start. What, what are some like, I and mean, you quadruple. What are some kind of struggles that you went through uh, as, as you went through your undergrad? Well, one of the struggles was actually not knowing what I wanted to do. And and now that I you know teach leadership and stuff, I, I share the importance of finding your purpose and and uh, creating a vision and this you know deciding where you want to go. And, and that was one of the challenges. Is I love. I loved so much. I wanted to do it all. And uh, so I did struggle uh, with that. Like, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do with my life? And, and so I just did it all, which led to a lot of practicing, right? Like three, four hours of classical a day, to two to three hours of jazz practicing a day, plus ensembles, plus studying. So it was a lot of work. So time management was certainly a challenge. And uh, I made a lot of sacrifices along the way where I was probably practicing and studying rather than having a a major social life. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to students who are, who are kind of in a similar boat, whether they're like really unsure of what they're doing or they're involved in so much because they just can't say no to anything? What, what kind of <laughs> advice would, would you give to students? <laughs> I would say for sure, like develop like uh, uh, some kind of morning routine where you can really center yourself, uh, even encouraging a morning meditation in, in the morning and just a deep breathing. Um, or find some other stress release, whether it's, you know, going for a jog or, or working out, um, but really taking care of yourself, making sure you don't skip meals, eating well, and uh, take time to, as, as my grandma used to say, take time to smell the roses and kick a few leaves along the way, because uh, life is short and um, you don't want to work yourself into the ground. You want to make sure that you have uh, energy to give to others. So if I could do it all over again, I would say, just breathe, Matthew, just breathe. <laughs> good, good advice, especially if you're in music. Breathing's pretty important. Um, let, let, let's tell me, what, what was your favorite class, your favorite professor in your undergrad? 
Um, I was just so influenced by my saxophone professor, who is actually still at Lawrence University. His name is Steve Jordheim, and he was a major influence. And I'm sure you can relate, and many college music ed students can relate. Your your private studio teacher um, is just so important. You spend the most time with them over your undergraduate years, and he was a, a mentor, and uh, he took care of me in, in in times when you know I had any challenges I had, he was always there to talk to. And, and so he was much more than a saxophone professor, an incredible saxophone teacher <laughs> that I learned so much from, but also just a great human being. And that's kind of the dual role I think of a music teacher is we're teaching music, but we're also teaching how to grow and become the best version of ourselves. And so I'm grateful to my saxophone professor for guiding me in that way. That's that's really awesome, and and like you said, I, there's so many people who can relate to the relationship you build with your with your uh, applied uh, professor, and it's 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 a really unique relationship that really in, in a music building is just it's right there. Um, go, let, let's let's go on. Uh, where did you get your first job? Where where did you start out? Sure. Yeah, I ended up uh, flying out to Colorado over my spring break of my sixth year at Lawrence. By the way, I should make clear that. It did spend six years. <laughs> so two two, vic two victory yeah. laps. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely uh, <laughs> six years for four majors, a double degree, Bachelor of Music, Bachelor of Arts, and double certification of student teaching. That was a lot. <laughs> and I, I recognize that I probably could have gotten a master's degree if I just made up my mind on something. Really. <laughs> but uh, I did uh, fall in love with the state of Colorado when I when I flew out there to, to check out some job opportunities. And uh, I just fell in love with the state and decided this is where I want to live. And I actually didn't even research the, the pay at all. I just fell in love with the beauty of Colorado. And I remember driving on the, the main highway, I-25, and uh, watching the sunset over the Rocky Mountains and most extraordinary sunsets I'd ever, I'd ever seen. So um, I just... It's like, wow, I got to move here. It, it turned out that Colorado was 49th in funding in the nation for, for education. <laughs> but I have to say that I was such an idealist. It, it never bothered me. I ended up taking a job in one of the lowest paid school districts in the state also, uh, which was in Loveland. It was called the Thompson School District. But uh, I loved every minute of it. I was a public school teacher for 15 years, eight years in middle school, and seven years in high school in Loveland. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, and then so you've you've done some stuff with the uh, American Band College, right? Tell tell us a little yeah, bit about that. Yeah, great, and be happy to. So, I was drawn to the American Band College when I, when I first found out about it. Actually, was in the summer of two thousand. I was attending the essentially Ellington Jazz Workshop for band directors in Snowmass, Colorado, and it was the first ever essentially Ellington. Uh, conference camp for for band directors so when marsalis and lincoln center jazz orchestra were there it was a really great event and my roommate turned out he was a student at the american band college working on his master's degree and i said what are you up to he's working on his final project and he said after this he was driving to ashland oregon i said no oh, tell me more about that and he told me about this master's program where he could get a master's in music education over three summers uh, about, about a little less than three weeks each summer and i heard that dr tim was part of it. That we all love the, Dr. Tim. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was the credibility for me right there. I was like, Dr. Tim? Dr. Tim's involved in this? That's amazing. And enough he's said. Like, yeah, he was like, he's one of the teachers. He he founded the American Band College with, with Max McKee. And uh, so the next summer, I found myself in the beautiful Ashland, Oregon, pursuing a master's degree and was there 2001 through 2003. And uh, it's an incredible opportunity if you're thinking about a master's degree because the professors are drawn from all over the world, literally. It's in the summer, so the, the musicians are free, so you get to work with uh, composers and conductors, and then the, some of the greatest teachers on every instrument will come in and be your instructors. So it's really a who's who in performance and music education. And loved every minute of it, and was so grateful when after I graduated, I was invited to join the staff of ABC. And so I get to work out there every summer from 2004 through 2011 also joined the the staff of the western international band clinic in seattle which was um, also related to the american band college and those experiences have led for me to meet and get to know and become friends with many of the greatest band conductors and composers and uh, music educators in, in our profession over the years. So every summer I was working at ABC and I've continued to work at, at WIVIC, Western International Band Clinic, 
every time I'm there, it's, it's an absolute masterclass of, of working with the finest in our profession. And I, I, I love just once again, speaking about the profession of music and music education, it's, it's such a small community and you're, you're so easily able to approach um, all, all these different master teachers and stuff and, and work together and come up with new ideas together because it's, it's for the students and that's just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we're so, actually seeing, we're seeing so much of that today, literally, uh, maybe more than ever with the, the coming together of music educators to support each other. That's, that's been remarkable how we've come together as a community. Yeah, let, let, let's go ahead and talk about it. That's kind of the big, uh, like, elephant in the world, <laughs> in the world right now. Literally. Um, um, COVID-19, the coronavirus, uh, everything that's going on with social distancing, quarantines, uh, a lot of businesses, a lot of schools are, are closed down right now, and it's it's a really uh, different world. Um, let, let's let's go back to like let's go back a month when kind of this was first really really hitting and impacting us here here in the United States. What are kind of like your reactions? What, what were some a actions or precautions that you were taking just starting off or to learn more about this? Well, sure. My, my parents uh, still live in Sacramento, and my younger brother lives in Jackson Heights, uh, New York. Uh, just next to New York City, and uh, I have a brother who lives in Berkeley, and, and a sister who lives in in Portugal, right on the border of Spain, in Guarda, Portugal. So I have a family in in basically like hot zones of COVID. So I was I was hearing about it, uh, what they were experiencing before it came to to where I am in in Wisconsin, and I have to say maybe like like many Americans, I, I was much in denial about it. In fact, I remember conducting a concert. On, I think it was March 7th at Lawrence and it was live webcast and my parents watched the webcast and we had this uh, freshman flute player featured on this uh, concerto with the with the band and afterwards uh, I gave him like a, a hug, shook his hand and then I think I gave him a hug and my mom was watching the, the live stream and she said Matthew what are you doing you, you can't you can't give people hugs you can't give so you can't shake his hand and, and I thought oh really like how could there ever be a world where we couldn't give hugs and couldn't shake somebody's hands? I was completely in denial. I thought there's, we can't live in a world like that. And in fact, to tell you that this true story, Thursday, March 12, I was flying out to uh, make it to Parkersburg, West Virginia, where I was going to conduct a, a middle school honor band mm -hmm. that weekend. And uh, at the time there were no cases in West Virginia. And I called my host beforehand. I said, Hey, how's, How's it going with COVID? And West Virginia was completely blank, not a single case. And again, I was in denial and I also wanted to honor my commitment. So I got on the plane from Appleton, Wisconsin, flew to Detroit, made the quick layover Detroit to Columbus, Ohio, get off the plane. And my host gives me a call and he says, hey, Dr. Rock, can you give me a call? Uh, and I called him right away and he said, I'm so sorry, I wanted to tell you in person, but an hour prior, the superintendent just shut down all large group activities. And I was fortunate to catch a flight to return and I flew back through Detroit, back home to Appleton. It was a eight hours of from 115 to 915. I went to Columbus and back. And it was when I was in the airports then and seeing the television that I realized how severe this was and what a mistake I had made to get on the plane. And it was the first time I'd seen people in, in, in real life, like wearing the masks and it was quite frightening. And I realized that this is, this is real. And uh, I, I was such an idealist again that I thought, I got to keep making music to the last second. We got to keep making music together. And the week before, I'd been conducting an honor band in Missoula, Montana. And I thought, we got to keep doing this. How could we ever have a world where we can't make music? And of course, the next week, everything shut down. And I think we've all come to, to recognize, of course, that was the right thing to do. And uh, what I've been blown away by is how the music educators got together as a community so quickly. Lisa Jansen Jones created the Music Educators Creating Online Learning Facebook page. It's up to maybe over 38,000 members now. I think I was like one of the first 10 members of the group. And within like days, it just exploded. There was a NAFME webinar that had like 9,000 people registered for it. Only 5,000 could get in on a time. And, and we were just all trying to work together. How do we teach online? And uh, everybody's been supporting each other. There's been a series of webinars that have been put together where mm -hmm. music educators are sharing information. What's also so cool is everybody's doing this for free. They're just like helping each other out. Composers are doing things like podcasts for free or webinars for bands for free. Everybody's just helping out and just serving. It's been a wonderful showing of the, the, the 
the, the beauty, the, the kindness, the compassion of humanity, and particularly of the music education profession. So one, one thing I want to touch on, uh, it, it's when, when you said you're, you're an idealist and everything, you're like, we, we got to keep ma- making music to the end. And, and I think, while it's definitely different now, how, how we can make and produce, listen to, share music. I, I've, I've talked about this before on our podcast, but during this time, I think it's more important than ever to, to share, share your music, whether, whether you're just sitting at home with, with, with your instrument and just playing something, sharing what you're practicing, or sharing a favorite piece of music, I, I think it's a really vital thing to, to actively go out and to share music because we, we're not going to have those large ensembles to where we're, we're going to sit down for an hour, an hour and a half and just be able to dive into music together and, and have that experience. So we have the technology today to really, really still, still keep making music. I, I know uh, one app, I, 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 there's a ton of fun apps you can do to make music. I've been using the acapella app and, and then I've been arranging songs and things like that and I just I play them and I just I share them to Facebook or or, or I, I share them to to Instagram or whatever just because I, I want to show my friends and my family it's like hey just just because I'm kind of stuck at home right now does, doesn't mean the music stopped I've I still love playing my horn each and every day I, I still love to listen to to great music and heck I'll, I'll pull up um uh, something a uh, part off of IMSLP and I'll, I'll, I'll put put on my headphones and and play a symphony, just because I'm like this 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 is, this is a way to still just enjoy and play music. I'll, I'm I'll reach out to friends, be like, hey, we should we should do this thing. We'll we'll do uh, click tracks and things like that, and that way we can still produce and share music. And I, I encourage like all the listeners out there, um, just share music. Don't don't let being at home don't let being wherever you are stop music from happening whether that's playing whether that's listening to whatever it might be the music doesn't stop it doesn't end here (laughs) i I couldn't agree more with you eric i I remember before COVID 19 really um hit us hard in 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 america and in the united states we could see those videos from italy and I, I was just bawling when I watched the video of the Italian opera singer singing Nessun Dorma from his balcony. And I thought how beautiful that was. Or, or in Spain, um, people coming outside to, to play or even bang pots and pans to, to make music. And, and I know that now in the United States, uh, music teachers are organizing porch concerts where they're encouraging their, their students to step outside on the, on the front door and and play maybe this, the high school's fight song at the same time. And, and I've heard that you can hear it across the neighborhood, people playing together across the neighborhood. And to me, that's just so uplifting and, and, and beautiful. I wanna, uh, you t- we're talking about music uh, during COVID-19. There have been some amazing creative opportunities that have come out of this. I wanna share one that we've uh, developed at, at Lawrence University in collaboration with the Lawrence alum, who now is the band director at the International School of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So it's called ISKL. And I actually had the opportunity to be an artist in residence there uh, a couple years ago. I I spent a February there working with the music programs. And uh, so when this all happened uh, with the shelter in place, Dan Miles, the band director, reached out to me and he said, hey, Matthew, how would you like to collaborate with your music education students and my actual high school students? I'm having them create uh, chamber music recordings via GarageBand, right, with the click track, and they put it all together. And I'm going to send those files to you, and your music education students at Lawrence can then make feedback audio tapes where they would use GarageBand and then listen to the student, and then pause it, and then insert some helpful solutions to help That's them awesome. raise their performance, right? And so now we have this collaboration with Malaysia, but it's, it's spreading. So we're also working with middle school students in Hong Kong, and uh, so it's just, it's just amazing. Now, this, this collaboration probably never would have happened if, uh, if you know, the shelter-in-place uh, order hadn't uh, occurred. So sometimes you know, in crisis, sometimes in struggle, that's when like, brilliance and creativity and, and like, the next level of thoughts are developed. I, I think of the, the story that I've heard of like, Isaac Newton when Cambridge University w- was apparently shut down for two years because of the plague. And that was the time that, that Newton in reflection, self-reflection had all that time that he developed 
uh, that the laws of gravity and, and optics and apparently co-developed uh, uh, calculus in those two years. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should like go on and be like a complete genius right now, but, but it is interesting to think about like what can happen when we just put the pause button on. Yeah, and yeah, and, and and that's that's really amazing. And, and talking about like kind of pushing the pause button, what, what are some of like the biggest adjustments you've had to make? And like you're you're, you're a teacher, you're, you're you're a musician. What are some adjustments you've had to just make to your day to day life? Right. So, um, all right. So one thing, a huge adjustment, of course, is that uh, kind of social emotional aspect that uh, we enjoy so much as teachers, which is you know, getting to walk into the conservatory of music where I teach and walk down the stairs and see all the students that are, you know, on the couches or, and say, Hey, Dr. Ray, how you doing? Hey, how are you guys? And, and that in-person interaction and, and students stopping by my office to talk. And of course the rehearsals and always, I always get there about 30 minutes before the rehearsal and so I greet students as they walk in the door. And then that magic that happens in person, that human to human, heart to heart connection, that electric energy of sharing, uh, you know, music and emotions and, and smiles and, and tears and all, all that uh, that happens in person. That's a, been maybe the, the biggest adjustment for me is, is not having that person to person connection. Um, I have found uh, through teaching online, we started officially teaching online on Monday, April 6 at Lawrence University. And uh, I actually found the, the classes like super rewarding and super enjoyable and seeing each other on a Zoom screen was, was a delight. And yep. yep, so, and I think it's, we're craving, atten- we were craving like this connection. So everybody's like ready to meet each other. Are you finding the same thing? Yeah, well, and so at Kansas State, we're on spring break and then we had an extended spring break by an extra week as they're kind of figuring things out and stuff. And they're, they, when they made the announcement, they're like, Hey, we're shifting all online. So we went into spring break kind of being like, okay, we're, we're just going to be off a week and we're going to get back to it, finish out semesters. I have a lot of friends who, who this is their last semester on campus or they're currently student teaching. And you, you kind of, you went into that spring break, not, not really expecting the world to change on the other side. Um, and so in conversations with, with uh, friends, um, it, it's definitely been a challenge to, one, not have that normal interaction and stuff. And, and two, uh, accountability is a huge thing right now, especially a lot of younger students, uh, freshmen, sophomores, I know are kind of struggling with this more than anything, just because they're still kind of learning how college works. They're, they're figuring out kind of the, the flow of things and, and how to be successful in college. What, what are some things that, that you do for yourself that help keep you accountable and on top of everything? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot. And, and one thing that's become really important to me is creating a routine uh, to create structure. And uh, actually, there was a TED Talk that was recommended to me that was about how uh, limitations can lead to creativity. It was called like Embrace the Shake. <laughs> and, and it made me realize that, hey, yeah, we are limited right now, but, but, but within this time and space, we actually can be really creative and really productive. So for me, uh, my routine begins in the morning. And so I have a morning routine that's really important to me. It begins with my attitude upon waking up, literally. So when the alarm clock goes off, and I like to refer to it as the opportunity clock, just a mental shift about, <laughs> you know, uh, about how I think about uh, words and, and their impact. So I wake up uh, in, in the morning and I've worked to develop a habit to th- rather than think like, oh, do I have to get up now? I would just a little more sleep, which used to be my habit. I've developed a habit to think something positive, like I can't wait for this day. You got this. I am grateful for this day. Uh, I wonder what this day is going to bring. And you know, after I, I make coffee <laughs> uh, in the morning, uh, I have a, a morning meditation that, that I do for about 15, uh, sometimes 20 minutes. And in, in that meditation, I, I focus on, you know, what I want to create. I focus on uh, what I'm grateful for. And uh, lately, I've really been um, meditating on hope. And uh, when you can create a mindset of hope in, in the morning, it, it really sets the trajectory for your day. And I've become a real believer in that, that thoughts affect our actions, that we can choose our thoughts. So we can either choose to look through a a lens of negativity 
or focus on the news or focus on the fear, or we can say, hey, this is my space. I'm safe at home. And that's the idea of shelter in place. We're safe at home. So while you're home, what are you going to focus on? And I don't watch the news. I just don't watch the news. Um, sometimes you can't help it because it might come across your Facebook feed. But I find that some of the words uh, are like real triggers, right? I'll see something and it'll like trigger fear in me. And then I'll have to work to, to do some deep breathing routines, go for a walk, focus on nature, everything that I've found to, to slow everything down, to slow my heart rate down, to make sure that I shut down my amygdala. Because what happens is when we're in fear, which a lot of us are, we call it an amygdala hijack. And so it's flooding our brain with neoprenophen and cortisol. And if that lasts for longer than it's supposed to, it can really start to do damage physically and it actually hurt our immune system. So I realized that uh, there's a lot of scary things. And it's like, after this interview, I'm going to go to the grocery store, right? And so I'm going to prepare for that. And that is scary. It's not fun mm -hmm. anymore. It's definitely go, like going out when, whenever you have to go to the grocery store or, or um, I, our, my church I attend has been recording services online. We just kind of have the essential personnel there. And like um, for the people who are doing the tech stuff and things, we, we all have masks on and everything. It's, it's really, wow. really weird to be in, in a church building. They're giving the sermon and stuff going through that. There's no one in there. And it's it's definitely just like wow this this is this is a reality right now and it, it 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 feels like a movie sometimes that that's just like this this is life right now this is this is the the normal day to day for for the next couple months or however long that this goes on. Right, right, and I think that's a big mental shift too. Is that like you said, however long this goes on, and I think if we if we latch on to like this is going to end on this day. I think we're better off not thinking that. I think we're better off preparing ourselves that this could go actually much longer. And anxiety is often created when expe expectations don't match reality. So if you think like, okay, by May 30th, this is gonna be all over, all going back to normal. And then May 30th rolls around and then you don't, you're gonna be like really anxious and really stressed. But if you think, hey, this could go on for quite a while, maybe until we have a vaccine, you know, which could be even longer than anybody's expected. And being okay with that and finding a way. Uh, of course, I acknowledge that the, the tragic um, position that, that many families are in economically and, and health-wise. And I don't want this to go on. I just think sometimes uh, uh, not counting on it ending it's, by a certain it's, date it's is definitely helpful. It's an unprecedented situation that we're, we're, all, we're all just trying to navigate through this kind of right now. Um, speaking of just navigating through it, what, one thing that you started that, that I, I'm so glad to, to help out and be a part of and also see, see it grow is uh, Upbeat Global. Do you want to tell the listeners a little bit um, what, what's kind of the idea behind that and what's the aim f for this uh, movement that you've kind of created and started? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, it's, it's great. I, I always feel when I start talking about like some of the negative stuff, I, my mood goes, <laughs> you know, so let's talk about something really positive and uplifting. <laughs> Uh, and, and I want to just talk about uh, things that are contagious, right? And so when, when we talk about uh, contagions, I think everybody thinks of one thing right now. That's COVID-19. That's all we can think of. It's everybody's mind is 100% is obsessed with that, it seems like. But I'd like to, to offer a shift of what we focus on because what we focus on expands and grows. And this is for an individual. I think we only... Um, really can make change within ourselves. We don't change other people, right? Change is a choice. So we have to begin with looking within. And I, I've often felt that the, the inner spirit, that our inner voice, that's like the, the last frontier that maybe we spent the least amount of time looking. Like we look out into outer space, we look into the deep sea, um, we look to discover new lands and, 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 and whatnot. But uh, it's sometimes scary to look within. But I encourage us to look within because when you look within, that's where real change can happen. That's where you can change habits of thought. And so I bring that up as an, as an introduction as to what Upbeat Global is. Upbeat Global is uh, an organization that, that I created to uh, spread positivity around the world as a contagion. Because I know that positivity is 
contagious. And if we can uh, shift our focus to think about what we're grateful for in life, what brings us joy, um, uh, how we can serve others rather than focusing on just what's in it for us, we can um, make a huge difference for, for all of humanity. And uh, this emanated uh, as a seed way back when in 2006, when I started a leadership program for my high school. So that's the, I'll give the evolution. Is that okay, Eric? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So in 2006, we created a, a leadership group for my high school band and we called it the Leadership Symposium. And we met once a week and uh, talked about different leadership topics. And mostly it was about what kind of band do we want to create? And I would pose these questions to my students. Say, hey, what do you want the band to be like? What traditions do you want to start? What's important to us? And how do we get there? And what's the role of a student leader? And how can students be empowered to become leaders and affect change? And we actually, as a group, came up with a definition of leadership, which is leadership is inspiring and encouraging others to achieve their full potential. And as you hear that, you see that leadership is about serving others. And that naturally leads to this idea that every student can become a leader in some form or another. It's not about the title. It's about what do you choose to do with the time that you have. And with the time that you have, you can certainly support and encourage anybody in the group. It doesn't matter what chair you sit in the band. You can always lift somebody up and look out for them. And, and sometimes it's the last chair student starts practicing more than they ever did and really starts improving. And that can be inspiring to, to anybody in the band. So that was the idea. And the, the lovely thing, that the magnificent thing that happened was it transformed the culture of the band. And it became a much more uh, supportive culture. Um, the, the, the productivity of rehearsals elevated as students recognized the importance that the individual played. Like they saw that if I was, I am proactive in practice, I can make a difference and contribute rather than waiting for others to, to learn their parts before they learn theirs. And so it raised our performance level, it elevated our fundraising ability as talk uh, went out to the community that we were training on leadership, that was an added benefit. And uh, we became much more of a service-oriented organization. So that leadership group uh, was highly successful. It's continued to this day. The director who's followed me has continued the leadership symposium. Real, real proud of that, and, and that's a fantastic thing. In 2014, I gave a clinic at, uh, at the Midwest Clinic in uh, Chicago, and uh, the topic was Leadership Matters, Enhance Your Music Program with Effective Student Leadership. And I shared the curriculum that, that, that we use, and at the time it was focusing on the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. John Wooden's um, uh, leadership is pyramid of success. John Wooden's the former basketball coach of UCLA, and um, John C. Maxwell's Twenty One Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Those were the that was the bulk of what we trained on, and so I presented that, and that led to an invitation to be a Con Selmer education clinician, and it was actually Dr. Tim who invited me to join Con Selmer Education's team. And so in 2015, I began teaching at the Con Selmer Institute in Mishawaka, Indiana. And that has led to opportunities that I, that I never would have uh, realized. And so in the past six years, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to present and conduct in over 25 states and four continents. Uh, it's been really an amazing way to see the world and see music education in, in all its forms, uh, band, orchestra, and choir all around the world. And so uh, I, over time, I got more and more interested in mindset, growth mindset, and that led to an interest in how do we acquire what people see as talent. And it led me to this idea that, that talent is recognized after the hard work, not before, and that talent is really a skill upon skill upon skill upon skills, layers of skills, and I learned about myelination of the brain. And it, it really led to a different attitude about teaching, that no matter where a student's at, Let's focus on building their skills and believing that they can achieve it. And that was a huge mindset shift for me. It also led to reading about positive psychology because I recognize the power of the mind in, in achievement. And so now I went down the rabbit hole of, of reading everything there ever was about positive psychology. And it, and it led me to the discovery that our thoughts lead to our actions and we can choose our thoughts much like a conductor chooses the quality of their upbeat 
and the upbeat is the gesture to, to bring the group in for the first beat of the piece. It can be beat four leading to one. It could be like uh, on Danny Boy, da -dee, da -dee, like two, three, four leading to one. Whatever the gesture is that leads to the downbeat is the upbeat. And we can either give a you know, very energetic upbeat. It can be a, a lyrical lilting upbeat. Uh, it can be an accented upbeat. It, it's the prep that leads to the downbeat. But what I realized is the prep that matters. And we can choose the quality of the prep. Much like the throw of the football is the, the upbeat, the catch is the downbeat, the, the shot of the basketball is the upbeat, the swish is the downbeat, the handoff of the baton in track and field is the upbeat, the catch is the downbeat, the way a band takes the stage is the upbeat to the performance, the way the marching band walks onto the field is the upbeat to the performance, the attitude that the teacher has when they walk into the classroom is the upbeat to how the class is going to go. And I recognize that we can choose our attitude and that's also our upbeat. And you can see the play on words, of course, right? You have the upbeat person, which is positive and, um, and that kind of upbeat. But the other one is, is relating it to music. And I think people can really latch on to that. So when I developed the concept of upbeat leadership and developed a curriculum uh, two or three years ago, uh, which is which I've given to, to you know, music programs all over, um, whether it's a three-day camp, a, a one-day camp, um, a webinar, uh, in any way I can help, people can latch onto that concept and it's made a world of difference and it's a lasting difference for organizations uh, because it's a simple concept and uh, people can um, use it to, to rethink how they approach uh, their daily thought process and their daily activities. And because leadership comes from within, every single person in the group can choose how they're gonna approach uh, the rehearsal, how they're gonna approach their interactions with others um, because you can choose your upbeat. You know, when you choose your upbeat, you can change the downbeat. When you change the downbeat, you can change actions. When you change actions, you can change a life. So um, that's, that's kind of the development of the concept of upbeat leadership. And, and Upbeat Global now is, is working to spread positivity around the world. And, and you kind of ask, like, what's going on? So I started a, a Facebook page, a business page called Upbeat Global. And I welcome all of you to, to go there. And that's become a landing space for uh, uh, webinars that I've been giving uh, and um, presentations that have been videoed. Uh, I started a YouTube channel called Epi Global. And uh, that's been really great to, to have the feedback from, uh, particularly from high school students. I've had high school students message me about the, the YouTube page. And those are videos that I've made are about two to three minutes with tips on uh, breathing techniques, uh, the idea of working together and spreading positivity. And uh, we've gotten a lot of encouraging messages from students saying, hey, keep, keep sharing these because you're really making a difference. Um, but I know I've been talking for a long time, Eric, so let me oh, let you interject here. Oh no, let's, let, let's, <laughs> so, so we're talking a lot about the upbeat concept. Uh, let's, so I, I would say kind of right, right now is, is, is going to be an upbeat leading into the downbeat that's going to be the world after this pandemic mm. after all, all this um um goes away where we're finally able to meet with our friends again where we're finally able to sit down in a concert hall with, with a full audience and, and perform uh for for our peers for our family for an audience um what what what's that downbeat look like what is what is the world going to be looking like and, and do you think there's going to be some let's focus on the positive. Do you think there's going to be some positive changes? Yeah, well, I, I do think that. And, and in my, my walks in, in the morning, I literally have been so uplifted by the messages that are left uh, by children. Uh, as I'm going on walks, there will be children that have used chalk art to leave messages for people about peace and hope and love and kindness. And I thought, you know, it's, it's the children that, that we need to listen to and, and learn from. There, I walked past a, a brother and sister playing hide and go seek uh, this morning, and they they seemed like you know just enjoying life and enjoying nature in, in springtime. And uh, in some ways, I think that we need to remember the kindness that we feel towards each other right now. I have a friend who's a band director in Milwaukee, and he he shared that he was out grocery shopping, of course, with gloves and, and a mask, and he was trying to get some mac and cheese multiple packages they have a 
two or three year old that that loves mac and cheese. As as, as most people do. <laughs> I think the college students <laughs> could relate to that. And uh, when he got to the checkout line, they said, oh, "I'm sorry, sir. You can, you can only purchase one box of mac and cheese." Because uh, I guess they thought mac and cheese was going to go the way toilet paper is gone. And uh, so he he. Was, you know, polite. He's like, oh, okay. You know, was shocked that he couldn't get more than one mac and cheese. But, the, but he he said that the the woman in line behind him went ahead and, and purchased uh, another mac and cheese box uh, and then gave it to him. And I thought, you know, that that's wonderful. And he he observed, man, people are being so nice. I hope this continues when we return. And that's what I think will happen. I think during this time, people are pausing. They're slowing down. They're appreciating their neighbors. They're appreciating what, what they had. They appreciate what they have. Maybe they're noticing that before this shelter in place, we were moving so fast, uh, almost too fast to, to show love and kindness to others um, because we're just trying to, to keep up with the rat race. And maybe we'll find a way to incorporate mindfulness, um, more love and compassion towards others in, in our life when we return to whatever the new normal is, but I hope the new normal is, is one where we show more uh, love and value for the planet earth. Um, that's been a, a real positive change as we're noticing blue skies in places where we haven't seen them. Uh, where we are also recognizing that we're, we're not so different from each other, that we're, we're all pretty much equal, right? That's a, a COVID has definitely been a leveler. And it's not so much about wealth, and the philosophers have said this all along, that it's, it's about um, love, it's about serving others, it's about giving to others, and, and taking the time to, to call your family members and, and your friends and letting them know you care. And I hope that that continues. But when, when we have those first rehearsals, Eric, and we do come together, oh man, that's gonna be incredible. I, I just imagine that once things just do get started, once once there's that first rehearsal, there's going to be tears in in people's eyes. I I know I know each each and every day I I I miss sitting in an ensemble uh, with, with with my friends with with uh, Dr. Trace uh, up there up front or our orchestra director Professor Dirks and just sitting there being able to make music with everyone and I just feel like everyone's going to appreciate that so more. Um, I, I, I'm just really interested to once this does pass to see how just just how it how it goes because we're 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 a, like instant gratification society right now and that was forced to just stop mm -hmm. to be like we, you have to stay home you, you, and it, I think it's really going to impact the world in 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 a uplifting manner in terms that there's a lot of people you see each and every day stepping up uh, um being generous uh um reaching out to people uh, and spending time with families spending having having an opportunity to just you know relax a little bit sometimes and and while it's there's a lot of uncertainty and with uncertainty there's fear i i think through people like like, like what, what you're doing with upbeat global and a wide variety of people this we're going to be able to get through this together. And I think that's the biggest thing a lot of people uh, need, need, need to know, need to hear is that we, we will get through this um, together, it, however long it might take. And to know that there's a lot of great people in this world and, and you have your family, you have your friends to so make sure you do reach out to them, connect with them just because you can't see them in person. Um, doesn't mean you, you, you can't do a zoom meeting. You can't, I, I've played, um, like board games or other kind of game, like online games with with friends, to where I have them pulled up on a video screen and stuff. We're just playing all these fun party games, mm -hmm. and it's just you can still connect with people. You can still um, um, we'll get this done. We'll figure it out. And I think this is that the downbeat of this new world uh, that that we're going to get into is it, it, just going to get right there, and we're going to be able to have just a, a new, fun, and more generous, more caring world. I think you're right, Eric, and, and I, I certainly hope that comes to pass. And uh, I think if there's enough of us that want to create that, we can. We can make that choice. You know, we can make that choice to you know pause and, and say hello, to ask somebody how they're doing, and, and actually pause long enough to and, and really care 
instead of just blazing past to the, to the next thing that we, we got to get done. Um, I think it's going to change the way we do rehearse. Um, I know that music teachers now in the way they're, they're teaching online learning, they're certainly taking that time at the beginning of, of a course, if they can use Zoom uh, to go around and just say, hey, how's everybody doing? They're having open lunch hours where they're just eating together. They're just talking, they're catching up, they're recognizing the important role that ensembles have played and that camaraderie, they're creating spaces to, for sharing. And uh, the shift is becoming more about that. Like, hey, how are you as a person? Rather than, do you got this phrase mastered? <laughs> do you got that 16 note passage mastered? Which, um, you know, the aesthetic beauty is, is always going to be important. Um, and we'll, we'll always appreciate that. But I think never at the expense of the human heart. And um, I, I, I've been teaching this for years about, you know, we can create cultures within our ensembles. And what I've been intentionally and deliberately doing is working to create cultures of gratitude, right? Cultures of gratitude where, uh, and where I share gratitude for the students and, and give them space to, to breathe in gratitude. Uh, we do gratitude breaths. And you can shift the, the feeling of a rehearsal by shifting what you focus on. Um, and you can create positive cultures. And I hope that uh, we will you know, see the value in that. So when we return, uh, place the, the value of uh, compassion and empathy at, at a much higher level. Dr. Rao, just thank you so much. I have one more question for you. I like to ask uh, my, my guests on the podcast. Um, just let, let, let's think freshman year you. First, first, day, first day of classes, first day on our just uh, starting, starting college, what, what, what's, what's the biggest word of advice that you would uh, give yourself starting out as a freshman in college? Uh, soak it up. <laughs> just really in, enjoy, enjoy this time. Uh, spend time with your professors beyond the class time and uh, know that they're there for you. And professors really appreciate it when, when you, you know, go spend extra office hours, take them to coffee, ask them questions, be excited about learning beyond uh, getting an A. Make it about how you can grow as a human being. Know that the professors are there for you, but also recognize that the students that you're going to school with are also gonna be your support system. Uh, if you become close friends, they could be your support system for the rest of your life. My freshman roommate was the best man at my wedding. <laughs> We're still close to this day. So enjoy uh, the friendships, uh, enjoy the opportunity to focus on learning and try new things and uh, be eternally curious. And uh, cause you just don't know where your life is going to, to end up. Um, but um, I hope that you find your passion. I know it, it took me a while to figure out exactly what I was gonna do as you heard, but uh, I was always passionate about uh, music and helping others. And so in the end, it, it was a natural, uh, thing that led me to music education. I just didn't know it at the time that that's exactly what I was going to do. Um, so appreciate the moments, appreciate the journey and the process. It's not always about the, the end goal or achieving the goal itself. I used to think it was, you know, it was about maybe the A getting, you know, first place or, and those kinds of things. But now I've realized that it's, it's not so much about achieving the goal as it is about who we become in the pursuit of the goal. And so enjoy the process and the journey along the way. And actually uh, take time to reflect right now in, a, in shelter in place. This is an important time in human history and try to see the lessons, try to find the good in what uh, we're experiencing now and, and take that with you as you move forward. And I wish you all the best of luck. Really well put. Uh, anything upcoming besides uh, everything with Upbeat Global, which you guys should check out on Facebook and YouTube, by the way. Um, yeah. And anything upcoming that, that you're, you're working on or you're planning on doing? Yeah, so um, just want to give ways for people to, to reach out to me because I always want to be of service to, to students of music of, of all ages. And so if there's a university that would love to, you know, have me share a webinar with, with your NAFME group or talk to your music education class, I'm super open to that. My email is Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W dot R dot Arau, which is A-R-A-U. So Matthew dot R dot Arau at Lawrence dot E-D-U. So it's L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E dot E-D-U. You can also message me on Facebook, just Matthew Arau. 
and uh, I'd love to, to talk with you or, or have an opportunity to, to mentor. And in terms of things coming up, I'm uh, there's so, so many. So it seems like I'm doing like two or three webinars a week, uh, and I do always post those up on Upbeat Global and on my personal Facebook page. There's also a group that I created called Upbeat Leaders that Eric's a part of, and it's a private group of people that want to be involved in the movement of spreading gratitude and spreading positivity. So if that's an interest of you, please uh, join the group and we'd love to welcome you to our community so that instead of uh, growing fear and growing negativity, we can grow positivity and create a beautiful future together. Dr. Rao, thank you so much for, for taking time out of your day uh, just to talk to me, talk to our listeners and everything. I, I really greatly appreciate it. Plus, it's nice to just chat with someone as well. Um, <laughs> thank you. Just thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Eric. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Once again, thank you so much to Dr. Matthew Rao for taking time out of his day to join us for this awesome interview and just talk about the power of positivity and his movement of Upbeat Global, which if, if you haven't already, make sure that you follow, you like, um, or on either Facebook or, or YouTube, subscribe to them, uh, Upbeat Global. They're sharing some awesome, awesome content from webinars to uh, uplifting videos, uplifting messages, and just some really great content, whether you're a student, whether you are a teacher or wherever you are in life. Just some awesome things and an awesome way to support uh, a really great educator in this field. Um, bef before we do our kind of final wrap up, just want to remind you guys once again for this episode next week, this next Friday, because we're weekly now, to send us uh, via social media messaging or through our email, notyourfortepodcast at gmail.com, what you, you are doing to adjust to, to this different time, whether it's how, how you're adjusting to online classes, how you're teaching your students, um, what are some struggles you've been through? What are some positive experiences? What are some learning experiences that you've gone through? Dr. Payne and I really want to be able to hear what you guys, the listeners are doing and just talk about it and, and see, see just kind of what, what, what this different world is like for, for everyone who listens, wh wherever you are. Uh, once again, just email us at notyourfortepodcast at gmail.com or message us on social media. Uh, that's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can message us through there. All right, so this has been Not Your Forte. Once again, take time to rate five stars, subscribe, like, and share. Share with your friends. That's a really important part so that we can continue to grow our listener base and help out as many people as we can. Um, make sure you like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're really easy to find. Just not your forte podcast. And tune in next week as Dr. Payne joins back and we continue to talk about adjustments in, in this time and what you guys are going through. So this has been Not Your Forte Podcast. See you guys next week. <laughs>